I would rather live a short life of glory than a long life of obscurity. This is an apocryphal quote attributed to Alexander the Great, and while it has no historical source, I believe that these words are more faithful to Alexander's character than anything quoted by historians. Alexander sought to follow in the footsteps of Achilles, and famously slept with a copy of the Iliad under his pillow. Yet the achievements of this young Macedonian king would far surpass those of the Bronze Age warlord who he sought to emulate. Alexander the Great would become the golden standard by which men like Caesar and Napoleon would measure themselves, and despite their great accomplishments, it is my belief that Alexander's achievements have remained unmatched. It is said that Julius Caesar once wept before a statue of Alexander. Caesar was in his 40s, while Alexander had conquered the known world and died by just 32. A short life of glory indeed. In the life of Alexander, we can get a glimpse of how the myths of figures like Hercules, Achilles, and Odysseus may have developed. If we did not have sufficient historical evidence, would we really believe that a man who claimed to be the son of Zeus conquered all of Asia in just 10 short years? There are many events in Alexander's life which skirt the line between myth and reality. One such example is the Gordian Knot. It was prophesied that whoever could untie it would become master of all of Asia. Alexander, with his usual wit and irreverence, simply cut the knot with his sword. This story I am inclined to believe, but perhaps less believable, though equally awesome, are the dreams which Plutarch reports that Philip, Alexander's father, and Olympias, Alexander's mother, had before the birth of Alexander. In his life of Alexander, Plutarch writes, quote, the night before the consummation of their marriage, Olympias dreamed that a thunderbolt fell upon her body, which kindled a great fire, whose divided flames dispersed themselves all about, and then were extinguished. And Philip, some time after they were married, dreamt that he sealed up his wife's body with a seal, whose impression, as he fancied, was the figure of a lion. Some of the diviners interpreted this as a warning to Philip to look narrowly to his wife. But Aristander and Telmesis assured him that the meaning of his dream was that the queen was with child, a boy who would one day prove as stout and courageous as a lion." End quote. Whether or not you choose to believe this account, I have no doubt that for thousands of years to come, men will still speak of the thunderbolt who set the world on fire, and this is how myths are made. Alexander's father, Philip of Macedon, though overshadowed by his son's legacy, was himself a man to be reckoned with. Using the technology of the Macedonian phalanx, which was an innovation on the Spartan phalanx, which deployed much longer pikes, Philip conquered Athens and Thebes and brought Greece under Macedonian rule. This would prove to be a crucial foundation for Alexander's success. Here we have again a perfect example of the cycle of civilization. The Athenians had long been civilized and their power was waning, but the Macedonians, who had long been considered uncivilized barbarians by the other Greeks, swept down from the north to usher in the new golden age, which would come about as a result of Alexander's conquests. In 336 BC, during his daughter's wedding ceremony, King Philip was assassinated by one of his bodyguards, Pausanias. The motive, whether personal vendetta or political intrigue, is unclear. The information which ancient historians give us is sparse and contradictory. But one thing was certain. At just 20 years old, Alexander was king. In a series of swift and decisive actions, Alexander eliminated all challengers to the throne, including his own cousin, and had those who were implicated in the conspiracy killed. Thebes, 
took Philip's death as an opportunity to revolt, but Alexander was ready. He had already seen combat at just 16 when he put down a Thracian revolt in his father's absence. Alexander acted quickly to brutally crush the Theban revolt and raised the city to the ground as a warning to others who might also contemplate rebellion. To establish his authority and quell dissent, Alexander embarked on a tour of Macedon, asserting his leadership and demanding oaths of loyalty from various regions and city-states. He then turned his attention to the northern front. The Thracians and Illyrians had also taken Philip's assassination as an opportunity to revolt, but they too were crushed by Alexander. Alexander had quickly proved himself to be a capable and formidable leader. Philip's conquests had laid the perfect foundation for Alexander. Having been tutored by Aristotle himself, and having inherited his father's army, Alexander might be considered the pinnacle, the greatest blossom, the ripest fruit of Hellenic civilization. Aristotle was arguably the pinnacle of Greek philosophy, and the Macedonian phalanx was the pinnacle of Greek military technology, even better than that of the Spartans. So Alexander had at his disposal the best resources of the Greeks. Alexander stands as an example of the very purpose of civilization. All of the might and wisdom of Hellenic civilization came to a point in him. A man who believed that he was the son of Zeus, a man who had his heart set on surpassing the deeds of Achilles and taking vengeance on the Persians for their invasions of Greece. Alexander had not only inherited his father's army and kingdom, but also his vision of a Persian conquest. Philip had harbored ambitions of conquering Persia and had laid the groundwork for a Persian campaign. Such a campaign would have been doubtless motivated by a desire for revenge against the Persian Empire for its two invasions of Greece, led first by King Darius and then by his son Xerxes. Although both invasions were repelled by the Greeks, Xerxes had made it into the heart of Greece, massacring the Spartans at Thermopylae and raising Athens. Such wounds are not easily forgotten. And I'm sure that Alexander, with his admiration of Achilles, brought a further mythic element to this conquest. Like Achilles, Alexander would head east to conquer Asia once and for all, ending the conflict which began with the Trojan War and proving the superiority of the Greeks over their far wealthier adversaries. After Alexander crossed the Hellespont with his army, Bridging the two continents as Xerxes had done before him, he met the Persians in combat for the first time at the Battle of Granicus River. In May of 334 BCE, just two years after Alexander had assumed the throne, the stage was set for a confrontation that would shape the course of history. The armies of Alexander stood on the western bank of the Granicus River, poised to engage the forces of the Persian Empire. The Battle of Granicus River would mark the commencement of Alexander's campaign against the Persians, and it would showcase his military brilliance and unwavering ferocity in battle. Arian gives an account of the battle in his life of Alexander. Quote, When Parmenio advised Alexander not to attempt anything that day, because it was late, Alexander told him that he would disgrace the Hellespont if he feared the Granicus, and without saying more, Alexander immediately took the river with 13 troops of horses and advanced against the showers of darts thrown from the steep opposite side, which was covered with armed multitudes of the enemy's horses and soldiers. Alexander did this despite the disadvantage of the ground and the rapidity of the stream, so that the action seemed to have more frenzy and desperation in it than any prudent conduct. However, Alexander persisted obstinately to gain the passage, and at last, making his way up the banks which were extremely muddy and slippery, he fell upon the enemy in a confusion of hand-to-hand -hand combat, while his men were still crossing over. 
The enemy at once pressed upon him with loud and warlike cries, and charged horse against horse with their lances. After they had broken and spent these, they fell to it with their swords, and Alexander, being easily known by his buckler and a large plume of white feathers on each side of his helmet, was attacked on all sides, yet escaped wounding, though his armor was pierced by a javelin in one of the joinings. Rosakis and Spithridates, two Persian commanders, fell upon him at once, and Alexander struck at Rosakis, who had a good breastplate on, with such force that his spear broke in his hand. While they were thus engaged, Spithridates came up beside Alexander, and, raising himself up upon his horse, gave Alexander such a blow with his battle axe on the helmet that he cut off the crest with one of the plumes. The helmet was only just strong enough to save Alexander, and the edge of the weapon only touched the hair of his head. And as Spithridates was about to repeat his stroke, Clytus prevented him by running him through the body with his spear. At the same time, Alexander dispatched Rosakis with his sword. While the horses were thus dangerously engaged, the Macedonian phalanx passed the river, and the soldiers on each side advanced to fight. But the enemy, hardly sustaining the first onset, soon gave ground and fled." End quote. Alexander's actions in this battle would set the tone for his entire campaign always in the thick of battle, calculated in his plans yet reckless in his courage. Alexander would go on to win battle after battle, sweeping across Asia, defeating Darius, subjugating the Persian Empire, and taking his army all the way to India. Perhaps the best example of Alexander's daring and recklessness in battle was during the storming of the Malian stronghold in India. Arian writes, quote, when the citadel was seen to be still in the possession of the enemy, and many of them drawn up in front of it to repel attacks, some of the Macedonians tried to force an entry by undermining the wall, and others by placing scaling ladders against it. Alexander, thinking that the men who carried the ladders were too slow, snatched one from a man who was carrying it, placed it against the wall, and began to mount it, crouching under his shield. The king was now near the battlement of the wall, and with his shield, pushed some of the Indians within the fort, and cleared that part of the wall by killing others with his sword. The shield-bearing guards, becoming very anxious for the king's safety, pushed each other vigorously up the same ladder and broke it, so that those who were already mounting fell down and made the ascent impossible for the rest. Alexander, standing upon the wall, was being assailed all around from the adjacent towers, for none of the Indians dared approach him. He was also being assailed by the men in the city, who were throwing darts at him from a short distance. Alexander was visible both by the brightness of his weapons and by his extraordinary display of audacity. He therefore perceived that if he remained where he was, he would be incurring danger without being able to perform anything at all worthy of consideration. But if he leaped down within the fort, he might perhaps strike terror into the Indians. And if he did not, he would die honorably after performing great deeds of valor worthy of recollection by men of the future. Forming this resolution, he leapt down from the wall into the citadel where, supporting himself against the wall, he struck with his sword and killed some of the Indians who set upon him, including their leader, who rushed upon him too eagerly. Another man he kept in check by hurling a stone at him, and a third in like manner. Those who advanced nearer to him, he had kept off with his sword, so that the barbarians were no longer willing to approach him, but, standing around him, cast at him from all sides whatever they could get hold of at the time. End quote. During this battle, Alexander sustained a severe arrow wound, but his men, following him into the stronghold, saved him from death, and ended up taking the stronghold. This was not the first time Alexander had risked death to secure victory, nor was it the first time he had sustained a near-fatal wound in combat. Alexander was, indeed, as courageous as a lion. In 323 BC, after conquering all of Asia in just 10 years, Alexander, at age 32, 
fell abruptly ill and died. It is unclear whether the cause was disease or poison, and if he was poisoned, who may have been involved in the conspiracy? Historians are divided on this subject. Alexander's final words and commands before his death are also disputed. According to Diodorus, when Alexander was asked on his deathbed to whom his kingdom would be given, Alexander simply said, to the strongest. Whether or not this is true, it is certain that Alexander failed to secure an heir, leaving his vast kingdom in chaos. Though it is somewhat haunting to think about what Alexander may have achieved if he had lived, he got what he wanted, to follow in the footsteps of his hero, Achilles, and leave behind a short life of glory and an immortal legacy. And it is worth exploring this connection between Achilles and Alexander in more depth. It is almost impossible to speak about the life of Alexander without thinking about the life of Achilles. Though Alexander sought to emulate the deeds of Achilles, and arguably surpassed them, Achilles lamented his fate. In the Iliad, when we initially learn of Achilles' fate, either a short life of immortal glory at Troy, or a long life of obscurity at home, he says that he would prefer to live long and humbly. When Agamemnon sends Odysseus, Telamonian Ajax, and Phoenix to bribe Achilles into rejoining the fight with gifts and flattery, Achilles rejects the gifts, saying, quote, Cattle and fat sheep, tripods and tawny-headed stallions can all be had from raiding, tripods all for the trading, and tawny-headed stallions, but a man's life breath cannot come back again. No raiders in force, no trading brings it back once it slips through a man's clenched teeth. Mother tells me, the immortal goddess Thetis, with her glistening feet, that two fates bear me on to the day of death. If I hold out here and I lay siege to Troy, my journey home is gone, but my glory never dies. If I journey back to the fatherland that I love, my pride, my glory dies. True, but the life that's left me will be long, the stroke of death will not come upon me quickly." End quote. At this point in the Iliad, Achilles clearly argues that one's life is more precious than material possessions. Though he laments the loss of glory and honor, he decides to return home, and urges his companions to do the same. To Achilles, his life is more precious than anything else. He only reverses this position once his friend Patroclus is killed by Hector. When his mother, Thetis, says, quote, You're doomed to a short life, my son, from all you say, for hard on the heels of Hector's death, your death must come at once. End quote. Achilles replies in grief and anger, quote, Then let me die at once, since it was not my fate to save my dearest comrade from his death. End quote. Achilles chooses to stay in Troy and avenge his friend, not for the sake of wealth, power, or glory, but for the sake of honor and brotherhood, for the sake of another life. However, in the Odyssey, when Odysseus summons the spirits of Hades and speaks to Achilles, Achilles laments his fate. Upon encountering the shade of Achilles, Odysseus praises his dead companion, saying, quote, but was there ever a man more blessed by fortune than you, Achilles? Can there ever be? We ranked you among immortals in your lifetime, we Argives did, and here your power is royal among the dead men's shades. Think then, Achilles, you need not be so pained by death." End quote. But Achilles replies, quote, Let me hear no smooth talk of death from you, Odysseus, light of counsels. Better, I say, to break sod as a farmhand for some poor countryman on iron rations than lord it over all the exhausted dead." End quote. Achilles would rather break sod as a farmhand than be a king among the dead. Wealth and power means nothing to Achilles. His immortal fame gives him no solace. In tragic fashion, Achilles suffers most 
from the very thing which made him great. His greatness was his destruction. Achilles' divided attitude towards his fate reveals a fundamental tension between two strains in the Western tradition. On the one hand, the desire to live a humble life of virtue with a Spartan simplicity, rejecting material wealth and the desire for personal fame. And on the other hand, the desire to be celebrated as a god, to rush headlong towards death and destruction, and to immolate oneself in a fire of glory, like Hercules. The origin of this divide can only be guessed at. Does it arise from the union of two separate traditions, perhaps one of Indo-European origin and the other from the European farmer populations? Or is this dichotomy essential to the tragic tension which is central to the European vision of the heroic ideal, the hero who suffers from his fate, the hero who must choose between happiness and greatness, the demigod who must struggle with his mortality and his divinity, and ultimately choose between the two. This tension was evident in Alexander's life. Alexander's men thought poorly of him when he began to adopt Persian custom and allow himself to be venerated and treated as a god. Arian reports that Callisthenes, a man who had studied philosophy under Aristotle, refused to prostrate himself before Alexander, saying, quote, I openly declare that there is no honor which Alexander is unworthy to receive, provided that it is consistent with his being human. But men have made distinctions between those honors which are due to men and those due to gods." End quote. The tension between the values of equality, humility, and brotherhood between men, and the desire for glory, immortal fame, and deification has always defined the West, and still does to this day. I have referred to this as the struggle between equality and excellence in the soul of the West. The same Roman Republic which hated monarchs gave rise to Caesar, and Caesar to Christ. In his histories, Herodotus explores this tension at great length. In fact, it might even be considered the central issue of the histories, or at least the central issue of his recount of the conflict between the Greeks and the Persians. Herodotus writes that when Xerxes held a war council to decide whether he was going to invade Greece, Artabanus, one of the Persian nobles, advised Xerxes against it. Artabanus says, quote, Do you see how the god hurls his lightning at the outsized beasts and stops their proud displays while the smaller creatures bother him not at all? Do you see how his bolts fall without fail on the biggest houses and trees? Thus does the god diminish all things outsized. In the same way, Two, a great army can be destroyed by a smaller one." End quote. Herodotus' warning and his theory of history and life, given through the mouth of Artabanus, is clear. Zeus strikes down mighty beasts with lightning, so it is with empires and kings. Though both Achilles and Alexander chose a short life of glory over a long one of obscurity, Achilles lamented his fate, thinking longingly of a long and humble life out of the sight of the gods. But Alexander, in his courageous recklessness and lust for glory, looked to the heavens and said, Let the lightning strike me. I will end this episode with the words of Alexander himself, as recreated by Arian. After almost ten years away from home, the same span of time which Achilles spent at Troy, Alexander's men refused to go any further. What follows is an excerpt from Alexander's famous mutiny speech, which he gave in response to his men and their attempted mutiny. Quote, Someone may say that while you endured toil and fatigue, I have acquired these things as your leader without myself sharing the toil and fatigue. But who is there of you who knows that he has endured greater toil for me than I have for him? Come now, whoever of you has wounds, let him strip and show them, and I will show you mine, for there is no part of my body, in the front at any rate, free from wounds. 
nor is there any kind of weapon used either for close combat or for hurling at the enemy whose scars I do not bear. For I have been wounded with a sword in close combat, I have been shot with arrows, and I have been struck with missiles projected from the engines of war. And though oftentimes I have been hit with stones and bolts of woods for the sake of your lives, your glory, and your wealth, I am still leading you as conquerors over all the land and sea, all rivers, all mountains, and plains. I have celebrated your weddings with my own, and the children of many of you will be the kin to my children. Most of you have golden crowns, the eternal memorials of your valor, and of the honor you received from me. Whoever has been killed has met a glorious end, and has been honored with a splendid burial. Brazen statues of most of the slain have been erected at home, and their parents are held in honor, being released from all public service and from taxation. But not one of you has ever been killed in flight under my leadership. And now I was intending to send back those of you who are unfit for service, objects of envy to those at home. But since you all wish to depart, depart, all of you. Go back and report at home that your King Alexander, the conqueror of the Persians, Medes, Bactrians, and Sakians, the man who has subjugated the Uxians, the Aracotians, and Drangians, who has also acquired the rule of the Parthians, Chorasmians, and Hyrcanians, as far as the Caspian Sea, who has marched over the Caucasus, through the Caspian Gates, who has crossed the river Oxus and Tanais, and the Indus besides, which has never been crossed by anyone else except Dionysus, who has also crossed the Hydaspes, Akesines, and Hydraotes, and who would have crossed the Hyphasis if you had not shrunk back with alarm who has penetrated into the Great Sea by both the mouths of the Indus, who has marched through the deserts of Gadrosia, where no one ever before marched with an army, who on his route acquired the possession of Carmania and the land of the Eritians, and in addition to his other conquests, his fleet in the meantime sailed around the coast of the sea which extends from India to Persia. Report when you return to Susa, that you deserted him and went away, handing him over to the protection of conquered foreigners. Perhaps this report of yours will be both glorious in the eyes of men and devout in the eyes of the gods. Depart." End quote. Though Alexander's legacy is as of yet unsurpassed, I believe that the time of Alexander's is not yet over, for though the earth may be conquered, its farthest reaches explored and populated, far above us, these stars patiently await.